This is a podcast by Householders Options to Protect the Environment, Hope Australia. We are a community environmental education and capacity building organisation based in Toowoomba, South East Queensland, Australia. This is a podcast in the series Eco Social Work in Australia. It was produced for Hope Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Diabo, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nations people in this country and acknowledges the unique contribution that their cultures make to contemporary Australia. Hello, my name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the Eco-Social Work in Australia podcast series. The eco-social worldview can be thought of as a values and principles lens which helps identify the characteristics of eco-social work practice. In turn, that lens is comprised of a number of facets or concepts which have been discussed by various guests across this podcast series. One such facet illuminates the primacy of holistic incorporation of physical environmental concerns wherever possible across micro, meso and macro scales of social work intervention. Another reflects the importance of integrating social, environmental and ecological justice concerns within eco-social work practices. And additionally, many facets of the eco-social lens also reflect a bigger picture concern for the damaged state of the current human nature relationship and the roles which the social work profession could and should play in helping heal that relationship for the long-term benefit of its diverse client constituencies around the world, both human and other than human. My guest in this episode, Dr. Sandra Engstrom, has a strong interest in such bigger picture human nature relationship concerns as a way of understanding and educating about eco-social work practice. She has worked in a number of international settings, including her current role as a social work lecturer and researcher based at the University of Stirling in Scotland. Her academic publication record touches upon many themes relevant to eco-social work practice, including the value of reconnecting with earth or nature connectedness, both as a client therapeutic and professional self-care resource, the role that eco-grief plays in responding to environmental degradation, and the theory and practice of building community resilience to extreme events. Dr. Engstrom talks with me now about how such themes interconnect and how they inform a holistic understanding of eco-social work practice and the value of that practice in approaching some of the closely intertwined social and physical environmental challenges increasingly faced by our client groups today. So welcome, Sandra. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm also looking forward to talking to you today. You've had some very interesting people on the show already, and I'm struggling to think what I'm going to add, but I'm sure something will come up. Well, um, let, you know, in time-honoured fashion, as far as this uh, podcast series is concerned, let's start the conversation through a self-introduction. Perhaps could you describe um, some milestones of your very interesting and international professional journey to date? And in the process, can you give us a beginning idea about how you developed your current interests in eco-social work practice, particularly in the context of that bigger picture human nature relationship perspective I mentioned earlier? Oh, where to begin? I sub- it's hard for me to think of a time when I wasn't connected to nature in some context. Uh, I'm from Calgary in Canada. Uh, which is very close to the Rocky Mountains within about an hour's drive. And we were out there all the time as a family, hiking, skiing, you know, it's it's a rite of passage to have skis, you know, shortly after you learn to walk in in parts of Canada and and skating. And and so it was a very outdoor uh, lifestyle that I led right from the beginning, even though my parents tell stories about how I would, they'd have to kind of push me up hiking trails and things because you know you're small and it seems forever um and you know there's a saying in our family that if we need a religious experience we'll go to the mountains um so that's that's always been it's been a, a place of solace and inspiration and and health and just comfort uh for me for for quite a long time and i used to work at a summer camp YMCA summer camp just outside of Calgary as well. And I would be there every summer. There are a few years I was there year round teaching outdoor education to K 
kids from kind of ages 10 to 12. I would lead five day canoe trips, five day hiking trips in the mountains and just really be there. Uh, and there's something very meditative and, and wonderful about not having to think about anything except where you're going to camp that night and what you're going to eat and where you're going to get your water and it, bring, it brings things back to basics, which is very essential at times. Um, so I think it, it's just been a, a relationship I've had that's been nurtured very early on. And it's as a result, it means that I kind of struggle to understand why people don't have that relationship because it's so integral to who I am and, and how I was raised that I can really not understand why people would look at that and think, oh, development, or, oh, we don't need to protect that. And, oh, it's just another place for, you know, let's just, you know, I don't need to put my stuff in a bin. So uh, I really, as a result of that, I really struggle to understand the, the opposite <laughs> um, experience, which is something that I have to be mindful of quite a lot. So I think that means that sometimes I can get a bit simplistic and thinking that everyone just needs to go hug a tree and you know walk barefoot in the grass and and we'll all be better but <laughs> I, I also not though that's not quite the case either but it means that I've had just an, an interesting view in the world in terms of how everything's connected and how I'm more attuned with my own needs and values when I spend time in nature and that there's this disconnect between how humans have evolved and where we are now in terms of our relationship with nature that I think needs to be healed and we need to go back to some of those basics and examine our place in the world as not being the top of the food chain and not being the most, you know, evolved species, quote unquote, out there. We're, we're part of it all. We're part, you know, we, the world will go on fine without us, but we can't go on fine without it. And, and I think that message um, is hard to, to, to hear for, for all of us. Um, but it's something that we need to go back to and think about how do we, how do we nurture that relationship? How do we heal that relationship so that it's, it's less one-sided and less destructive. Fantastic um, to hear that. Uh, you know, just, just one thing that strikes me off the top of the, the batters in sense is that early experience, that outdoors experience, for want of a better term, a lot of research, I uh, remember doing environment led, you know, many moons ago now, but uh, the research even then, you know, 20 odd years ago about the more youthful, the actual introduction of uh, young people to the outdoors uh, or the, you know, sort of na nature generally, the more strongly would, uh, would you see, tend to see a, a developing uh, relationship with it in the sort of ways that you've described, which is perhaps not surprising, but, you know, worth being reminded of that. More recently, I think, I mean, there's been a long history of nature appreciation, hasn't there? I mean, going back to the likes of John Muir and people like that, you know, the 19th century and all this sort of stuff. But I mean, it seems to come and go. It seems to ebb and flow. The most recent iteration that I've encountered is this concept of nature connectedness, which I think, you know, as you talk a lot, you know, a lot of what you've said uh, resonates quite closely with that. And, there's, and luckily now we're seeing, you know, university level studies on nature connectedness and the benefits of being outdoors uh, and, and making those sort of connect connections you know both physical and almost semi-spiritual that you mentioned but look sandra let, let's now move on um so somewhat you know and build on that history that you've just been describing uh, that very important understanding of where you come from you know in the sense of those personal and professional influences give us a bit more detailed picture now though um if you can of what eco-social it means to you in the present moment so you know bringing up to speed in 2022 so the specific question is, for you, what is eco-social work practice in 2022? And do, and do you want to say anything any more about what is shaping your interest right now at this time of interview? Gosh, so many things. And I think what it was interesting that you mentioned John Muir as well, because there's some interesting debates around national parks and conservation and, and access. And, um, you know, in, the, in part to the UK, there's there's right to roam rules. So you can go anywhere and camp anywhere. Um, but I know this is not totally answering your question, but it's just interesting to see how people um, respond to then having to book campsites or the lack of infrastructure to support people that commonly go to common, to kind of understood this is a good place to camp um, and the, the impact that has on the ecosystem. So I think it's, so that's one thing in terms of like there, especially with the pandemic, there were more people trying to access 
natural spaces after we had been stuck inside for so long and and you know these and social media you know trying to get that good picture and blah blah, blah. <laughs> um, so I think that's part of how do we you know we want to encourage people to enjoy the outdoors and to to recognize the benefits that it has but the flip side is that there needs to be that infrastructure I think and that that recognition that there shouldn't be you know hour-long lineups to get to the top of a peak um to just like so I have various various opinions on on all of that that I won't go into, but it's just it's just another thing to add to the debate in terms of of where do we go in terms of supporting people to access nature and yet recognizing that we need to do that with an an element of stewardship and, and care. Um, and and I think part of part of that is recognizing just and being more aware and identifying what what are our everyday practices personally and professionally in social work that have led to our current climate crisis and thinking about the role that social work would have in contributing to the change you know there, it's there's a choice you can contribute to the change you can contribute to sounds a bit drastic but further destruction um of, of the you know the status quo so to speak and how do we support individuals families communities to make sustainable behavior changes. So I think that's an, that's an interesting space for, for social work to, to fit in. Um, Cause it's hard to think about who else is doing that job, I guess. Um, there's a lot of messages to think, you know, change your light bulbs, drive less with the current energy crisis. I think people probably are driving less, um, but that's for the wrong, not for the wrong reasons, but it's, um, but there's, there's government messages but how do we put that into practice in a way that various families will be able to make sustainably? And if there are individuals in poverty, individuals in you know domestic violence situations, individuals with a mental health diagnosis, how do they make sustainable changes that for very good reasons are not the top of their priority list? <laughs> you know, they've they've got more other basic needs that they're trying to meet. Um, and then I think what what else is shaping my interest is just the emotional toll that it has on on everyone in, in various capacities um it's becoming more prevalent there's a lot of work in eco psychology around eco anxiety eco grief and i'll probably touch more on that later on but i, I think social work has again another can be another place to fit in there in terms of how do we support people with some of these deep feelings and and perhaps behavior changes or how do we make sense of maybe questioning ourselves and you know, like what role have I played in like the current climate crisis and that that can be a hard realization to come to and how do we support people and, and communities to make those changes um and yeah I'm just I'm always going to be wanting to encourage people to spend more time in nature and and, and not just the sunny days. And I, I'm one for not always liking to spend time in the rain, <laughs> which is unfortunate since I live in Scotland. Um, but it it is an important, you know, you have to be out there in the mud and the rain and the cold and the snow, as well as the sun and the and at the beach <laughs> to fully appreciate the seasons and the cycles. And you can start to pick up on, you know, helping people to pick up on how things are changing you know it's been a very wet spring here in Scotland so far is that is that a sign of things to come is that is that just the way the year is going to go it, it's hard to say and, and what impact is is that having on the farmers on every other um, aspect of where we are social work also needs to there needs to be a bit of a reckoning in terms of the historical role that it's played in the mentality that humans are at the top of the food chain um, and that there is a, a, a certain way of thinking, a certain way, you know, a very Western white way of, of being. And I think that we need to come to terms with how damaging that has been to, we're getting to that point where we know how damaging that's been for people. Um, but there's more recognition, I think, in terms of how damaging that's been for the natural world and for the, the communities and the, you know, the indigenous populations that have, that steward, stewarded and, you know, took care of, of our planet and the natural world for so long. Uh, and then 
a lot of those communities were, you know, killed. They were taken to residential schools. There were, you know, all sorts of um, negative, negative things happened to those communities. And, and social work had a, had a part to play in that. And I, and I think that we need to, to come to terms with that and to realize that those communities and those populations have a lot to teach us about how to heal and how to move on and how to return to a place of balance. Absolutely. I, I mean, just taking a couple of themes out of that that, that uh, strike me, you seem to be pointing, you know, there is that debate, you know, looking at the history of uh, evolution of ideas and, and specifically within social work, that social work is um, a product of modernity of that, of a set of values that, amongst other things, has a view of human exceptionalism, that uh, humans are at the top of the pile, you know, whether that's coming mm -hmm. from a religious viewpoint or others. <laughs> and, and you could argue that that's been given a really sort of savage twist over the last 40 odd years, not that it, it needed much of a twist, but it's been given even more of a twist through neoliberal uh, market-based economic uh, ideologies that have actually just allowed that to run rampant. So, you know, the, the wisdom of the market, the idea that the uh, the natural world is a free dumping ground for waste, you know, that the, the externalities argument of, of economists. I'm coming back in the next life as an economist, you know. Uh, but, but, um, <laughs> you're putting this in so much better and you're wording this so much better than I did, so please keep no, going. No, but I, I think that whole thing about, you know, that at that meta level, at that um, macro level, a reflection on the very value base uh, and, and the sort of belief system that actually underpins, you know, our professions, but also our lifestyles, you know, uh, very valuable. Sort of moving now somewhat from that more, that macro level down, perhaps more to, you know, into meso micro levels or more pragmatic levels anyway. You, you've started to point to this, but, you know, you've set up the stall there in regards to some of the principles and the values of, you know, eco social work from your perspective, particularly around that, you know, nature connectedness um, side of stuff. But how about actually now looking at ask, asking you something about, you know, how that might now get, um, in, you know, sort of applied in more pragmatic ways. So um, the question might be, you know, how can eco-social approaches and particularly, you know, using the, the, the themes that you've, you've been talking about there, nature connectedness, help tackle client related ecological sustainability challenges such as climate disruption, its various impacts or the loss of nature, for instance? How how do we actually get in there and get our hands dirty, as it were? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I'm I'm sure there's some brilliant brilliant work being done out there that I have no idea what it is. Um, <laughs> but I think um, I think at the core there is that supporting people to to even just investigate their relationship with nature um, and sustainability and, and the impact that has on their sense of self. Um, their sense of identity. Where do they, where do they see themselves in that that macro uh, ecosystem? You know, um, and I think providing safe spaces and, and brave spaces to examine that relationship and is is kind of a, a key place to start with because if we don't know what it could like, we don't know what we don't know, right? So so if we haven't even thought about it, then why would we change our behaviors or, you know, why, why would I do anything if I don't know that that's part of who I am? And I think, um, like you said, in terms of some of the neoliberal thinking and, and the, the challenges in, in consumerism and, and modernity, the, the prevalent behaviors are to not necessarily do that. It, you know, it's, it's a bit to numb. It's a bit to, you know, I need more stuff. I need to, keep up with the Joneses. So I think there's um, like, we call them, there's sometimes a, a free, you know, like a bit hippie-ish, like the people that, you know, go to the festivals and eat organic and, you know, vegan, vegetarian, and, and all these things, they're, they're still slightly on the fringe. I think vegan and vegetarian is, is getting there. It's as, as someone who is vegetarian and, and tries to be mostly vegan. Um, it's getting much better, but it's still a little bit on the fringe of, of society. And it would, It'd be nice to see it even more integrated and less. Um, is it so stigmatized? I don't know, but hmm. just just a little bit more. In, uh, so just that behavior change and just and sometimes it's just bringing that awareness. And you know, we don't all have to be vegan all the time, but you know, we can, we're, we're humans. We're not robots. We're not going to be make a hundred percent of the right choices all the time. It's not possible. So it's but hope it would be nice if social work and and all of, and as a collective we could 
try and get to like over 50 percent <laughs> maybe um, to of of positive and you know pro-environmental behavior change and then another big thing that i think uh, i'm quite passionate about is encouraging community building and that community resilience to support each other so that you know that you're not doing this on your own and you've got a group of people and a group identity to to connect with in order to to think about what this might look like in what it, wherever you live wherever you work because it is going to be different you know it's Scotland and Australia, for instance, are two very different places. Um, and, and what's needed, you know, you you guys have been in drought for an exceedingly long time, and and our risks are floods. So it's we're going to need different things, but we still need community and and support to to think about the wider issues on a local level. And it's it's easier to do that when you've got a group of people. Uh, and you know, if and when a disaster does happen you know that you've got that support to recover, to heal, to build again, to, and you're just more resilient. So that's, you know, part of my work is, is thinking about community resilience to extreme events and, and things like, you know, knowing local expertise, you know, who's got what tools, who's really good at phoning people when needed, who's really good at organizing, who's, so, just knowing your community and knowing what local experts you have and what local expertise you have, I think is, is really important that, that social work can help identify. Um, something that I'm, I'm also quite adamant about, and I've been having some interesting conversations with, with colleagues about this over the last few days, is that social work cannot do this by itself. And social work as a profession is naturally quite interdisciplinary in terms of who it works with traditionally, you know, education, health, maybe police, um, local government. But I do a lot of work with geographers and epidemiologists and people in heritage studies, people in, you know, international law, in international committee. So there's an even wider network of people doing really interesting and valuable things in terms of how do we support humanity <laughs> through this climate crisis and all the various aspects of that that we that we need as humans to kind of to be okay and to to feel connected to place and to space and some really interesting work around um you know how do we how do we save monuments that, you know, if, you know, in, in Nepal, I know there's been some really interesting work around how do we save some of the traditional monuments and sculptures and architects, because for the people that live there, that's a very important part of, of their life and who they are. And, um, and I think that social work could have an interesting place within those conversations in terms of what people need holistically. And, you know, if we think of those eco maps, you know, what we need at micro personal level, cultural level, societal level, to, to feel okay, then all these other disciplines, I think, could be involved in having, um, supporting us, supporting people in terms of how we recover and become more resilient and, and protect what, what we want to protect when, when it comes down to it. Um, oh, what else? Uh, empowering communities, uh, again, Communities are a big thing. I'm a big fan of communities. Um, my ba my master's is in international community social work, um, and I think that there's it is a fine balance between you know how much government support do you want versus how much community support, and um, we're not here to discuss that. <laughs> uh, but there is, you know, your the power that that a community has in in just helping us feel okay with whatever is going on and not feel alone. And I think that's, you know, when you have to make a big behavior change or if you have to make, um, recover from something, knowing you've got people around you that will help you out is such an important recovery tool um, that in some places recognize better than others, I guess.
Sandra, very interesting indeed. I just, again, um, just w- picking out one idea from that it was interesting. You know, we're doing this uh, comparison. We're talking about this comparison between two different countries at different ends of the of the uh, planet, Scotland and Australia. Um, the varying sort of climatic challenges, uh, drought and flood. But in fact, ironically enough, in Australia, the last, um, well, the f- first few months of this year, it was around the other way that there was there's been massive unprecedented floods down the east coast um eastern seaboard of australia and to cut a long story short i mean huge amounts of damage huge amounts of human dislocation dislocation caused by these floods a recognition i think by all sorts of authorities that a new approach has to be developed to deal with these um what they're not going to be the last um major environmental weather driven uh disasters so um i think there's a recognition that some of the old formulas are no longer working and so these fresh ideas that you're bringing in um and others as well around new forms of community resilience um strategies are absolutely vital it seems to me um look you've given us a number of those you know fresh new ideas and there's a vision building there for new a new set of opportunities you know which could come into play for the profession if indeed the mainstream profession social work profession does decide increasingly to transition toward helping to build that new eco-social world, which leaves no one behind, that as envisaged by the World Social Work Day and People's Global Summit theme for 2022. Nonetheless, it's about this stage in each interview that I play devil's advocate for a moment to ask a form of rhetorical so what question, intended though, frankly, as a way of further reinforcing the vital importance of considering the eco-social work turn within mainstream social work. So the question becomes, uh, for you, Sandra, this is all very well, what you've been talking about. Fantastic stuff, right? But but basically, why should the mainstream social work profession internationally be involved with the sort of physical, environmental concerns and sustainability challenges we have been considering so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, who needs it, really? <laughs> Just pave it all. Um, I guess it goes back to that bit around how I really struggle to understand why someone wouldn't um, you know, want to protect the mountains or protect the natural world, that it's getting to the point where we're not going to be able to ignore it. Uh, and I think in many communities, you know, certainly in parts of Australia, parts of Scotland, parts of, you know, any country, I think at this point, I, I can't, I'm pretty sure, sh- you know, I'd, I'd be hard pressed for someone to find a country that hasn't been affected by some aspect of the climate change and climate crisis at the moment. Um, so it's, you know, it, for me, it's how can we not, I guess. So it's, it's not even a matter of, I suppose, as, you know, there are very valid reasons why we have different specialties in, in social work and we, and we need them. And it, it's very important. And I'm not saying that climate change and thinking about climate crisis should, should be more important than any of them. But I think it's, it's getting to the point where we're not going to be able to separate it as much as we we are at the moment in terms of some of the stress, some of the the emotional, the financial impact of climate change is having on people's day to day lives, and and we can't just say, oh, you know, you lost your job as a result of this. Let's try and find you more work. So that well, you perhaps you're in the oil industry. And your oil company has decided to transition uh, to try and transition to a more, you know, environmentally friendly type of industry. And you need to reskill, or you're no longer employed by them because they're they're having to restructure. You know, how does how does this change in environmental behavior from your company affect you? You're you're now fired. So what does that mean on your opinion on changing? to pro-environmental behaviors, pro-environmental industries. So there's things like that, you know, are people, is that going to impact on someone's, I don't know, are they going to start having, using substances in an unhealthy way? Are they going to take their stress out in a way that's not helpful? So I think these are links that are easy for me to make in my mind, but might not be, and probably aren't for for quite a few other um, people, but I can see those links happening more and more often. And I guess if we we think about 
globalization and supply chains and, and these wider things, you know, if we think about where COVID started, it's because of more human animal interaction. If we think about the current Ukraine crisis, the impact that's having on global food. And uh, there's been some talk in the green social work world about the impact of just ammunition, more ammunition being in the atmosphere, what's that people, what's that doing to the environment? So there's these very substantial global concerns that are directly linked to the environment that for me, we need to keep that, that link in mind when we're working with people to recover uh, and to move on. Um, you know, there are going to be, you know, already, like you've said, we've had massive flooding, we've had massive fires. There's, there's a heat wave in Spain recently, like all, all these, like, we're just getting more extremes. So in terms of Australia, you know, you're having the extreme of the flood, but you're also getting the extreme of the drought. And so all of these things are just becoming more and more day to day. And we, we can't, for me, there's no longer a place to not think about it. I guess it's, it would be irresponsible for me. Oh, well, thanks, Sandra, for that comprehensive and frank appraisal of why eco-social work practice um, must play an increasingly important role within the global mainstream social work profession going forward. And now, as we go forward ourselves, as we, as we move uh, toward, closer toward the end of this very thought-provoking discussion, let me ask you to turn your thinking towards the future. And by future, I'm not talking here about a simple projection of existing trends. Rather, I ask each guest to draw upon their creative imagination as anchored to their research and practice interests and to ask them for something of their vision for a preferred future for eco-social work oriented practice within the social work mainstream and how we might look forward and toward that future. So the specific question is, what could or should the short to midterm future, say the next two to 10 years, hold for eco-social interventions within mainstream social work practice? I think it goes back to some of my what I was talking about at the beginning in terms of supporting an, an awareness and and perhaps evolution of people's relationship to nature um, and relationship to the wider ecosystem. I think there's something to be said for adding an element of the physical and natural environment on on individual family or community assessments. Uh, I think I think could be important way to to integrate some of this thinking. And just an increased professional awareness of how the various ways that climate the climate crisis can affect individuals and, and communities and various populations, you know, especially in terms of global movement as well. People are moving all over the place these days. How does how, you know, if someone's come from another country, what was the environment there like? What is it like where they where they are now? Is that something that needs to be explored um, in terms of working with a family? I'm a big fan of reflective practice, and I know that that most social work has has elements of reflective practice and supervision. Um, and I think there's there's a strong need for social workers to go for all of us to have more reflective eco-social work practice in terms of what is our own narrative about the natural world and climate change and and what is our relationship with wanting people to care or what what we see the future as in terms of the next generations. Um, and how do we look after ourselves in this work? You know, and I, I know you've talked to Meredith Powers about this. You know, we're good friends. We we write together, and we've written about how eco-social kind of taking care of ourselves in terms of all of this work. Because if if you're burnt out, you're not going to be any use to anyone really. And it it can be overwhelming to think of a problem this big and not know the next step and to feel a bit paralyzed in terms of, but it's so big, there's however many billions of people in the world, I'm just one, how does recycling this piece of paper actually make a difference? Um, so there's there's elements of a lot of self-care and, and creating more communities of practice around eco-social work and, and reaching out to, to networks and other people that you are doing in the work to sustain yourself and also just get more ideas around how to support individuals and communities. Um, community social work itself is something that I think has, has various 
presence in different countries. In, in some countries, community social work is very strong still. In other countries, it's it's barely existing. Um, and I think there's there's an element of, of needing that community social work practice to, to bring people together. And it's, you know, some people will bring people together around a community garden. Other people might do litter pickups. You know, there's, there's p- pieces of work that groups of people can do together to, again, feel less isolated and feel like you can make a difference in at least your own local sphere of support and sphere of, of influence. Um, <clears throat> something I'm particularly interested in around all of this and why as kind of wider society and hum- humanity we're, we're struggling with making the necessary changes is that there's a need to support the huge amounts of generational and historical trauma that are prevalent in almost in you know every culture in every country around um war around climate change events around just humanity evolving really um and a lot of that how that's been processed or not processed gets passed through generations and that will have an impact on how we view the world how we view our place in the world and so if if some of that hasn't been addressed then we're not going to be able to to look at climate change in a in a sustainable manner and we're not going to be able to make behavior changes if if some of these wider complex societal ways of thinking and values and behaviors don't support that um and and on that note we need to amplify the work that's already been being done especially with indigenous populations a lot of this work is not new it's it's thousands of years old um from you know i i'm i'm a white western woman i i know i don't i know a very small tip of the iceberg in terms of 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 this section of knowledge but there are there are populations and communities that have carried practices forward over thousands and thousands of years in terms of stewardship, in terms of bio, supporting biodiversity, connecting to nature, thinking about having a different worldview. And we need to, to amplify that work and, and recognize that there are, there are experts already out there doing the work and it's we're not reinventing the wheel, basically. Um, and we, you know, we got off that path of thinking through colonialism, through consumerism and growth at any cost, which was traditionally and in some ways still is a lot of the message um, in the the neoliberal space that we primarily are situated in. Um, And we're now feeling the impact. You know, we've been feeling the impact for, for years, but finally that societal consciousness is there's more movement in terms of how do we how do we get over this? Um, and as I've alluded to before, I think there's there's a strong need for social work to recognize what harmful practices it has it has played in how we've got here, um, in in anything that's that's still being done in terms of that way of thinking. I think there's a need for some some really strong and substantial behavioral and value based shifts. That's not just turning the lights off at the end of the day. That's not just you know, making sure that you that you walk to work or you know take sustainable transport instead of driving. I think there are some some wider societal and value based consciousness ways of thinking that have been in place for thousands of years. So it's going to take a long time <laughs> to to shift that. Um, but I, I think we're we're getting to that point where. It's no longer, and and you alluded to this before as well. Like it's it's no longer a question of of if climate change is here. It you know it is here, but people are going to be in in various states of readiness for change, and a lot of people are not going to be ready to change. A lot of people aren't going to care, um, which makes me sad. <laughs> uh, but and and that needs to you know it needs to happen at all levels, and I think hopefully there's a place for social so, so, for social work to to help promote change and influence at all the various levels that that it does in other spheres of social work. So how do we trans, transform that to 
thinking about climate change as well. Well, Sandra, thank you very much, you know, for giving us a great vision, you know, but very much, you know, anchored to your earlier ideas, concepts, beliefs and values as you've articulated them throughout the discussion. I mean, just a couple again, picking up a few things, you know, tapping into indigenous wisdom. And, and I think uh, you amongst a number of workers are pointing to the very great value of what we can learn from First Nations people and what we must learn from them, you know, and, and coupling their uh, millennia old, in some many cases, uh, wisdom, you know, of, of earth connectivity and earth connection to, um, you know, a rethink of our Western worldviews uh, so far as uh, human uh, nature relationships, that sort of thing. And also that, again, that very strong theme, which you've meant, you've touched on a couple of times around community, the building of community. I mean, uh, it's perhaps no um, accident or coincidence that seemingly uh, eco-social work has found that good home uh, amongst, you know, community um, capacity building workers. I, I worked with a couple of students in my local area here and uh, with an eco-social work group, and that is essentially a building on the skills of uh, community development workers, community capacity builders, uh, social work um, employed uh, people. So, look, um, fantastic to hear all that. And, look, let's hope that we can all help make your vision and those aligned visions from um, our other guests who have talked about similar and other and different things uh, in terms of their visions, a reality over time. And finally, look, coming to the end of this uh, very, very interesting interview, Sandra, and uh, based on that idea that people tend to remember the first and last things they heard in presentation, um, I just want to ask you now that uh, summarizing question that I also ask all guests to generate a bit of a pithy response that listeners can ponder as they finish listening in podcast land, um, cyberspace. So do you have a short take-home message uh, or one or two key ideas from your conversation today that could help sum up your interests uh, and uh, your views of the way forward in eco-social work practice in 2022 and beyond? So it, it does go back to that kind of what what is your relationship to nature um, and and how do you... Does does that need healing, I suppose, and just, just investigating what that is? Um, but the question that I was trying to find was I did my yoga teacher training a few years ago. And one of the things that we were asked was to find something in nature. And I think it was, you know, asking that thing. So for me, it was asking a blade of grass. What is it that you need to do your job well? Um, and we were all tasked to find something in, <clears throat> in nature that, that we would ask that question to. Um, and then we came together at the end and some people talked about what, and, and you just listen, which seems a bit strange to listen to a blade of glass. That's, that's not an easy concept for a lot of people to grasp. Um, but there is something, if you really, you really focus on, on that, there's, it's tapping into that wisdom that is in you somewhere that knows that you are connected to that blade of grass. Um, and, and I think, you know, I would challenge people to go out and find a piece, find something in nature, even if it's the plant in your house, in your flat, where, wherever you are, and, and look at it and say, you know, what, what do you need to be well and, and you know, to do your job well? And, and I asked it later to, to a rock, to a, to a tree, and, 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 and you do remember how connected we all are. As, as a result of just that tiny little exercise um, and kind of almost meditative practice, as it were. There's a, there's a recording that I'm going to be watching later about with Joanna Macy, who um, anyone who's, who's in this work knows who Joanna Macy is. And, and I had the privilege of, of seeing some of her work a few years, quite a few years ago in Calgary. And, um, but it's a recording on climate change as spiritual practice, which is, Again, won't won't be an easy link for for a number of people, I don't think. But I think it's it's an important perspective to consider when we think about a you know bringing amplifying those indigenous voices, like I've said before, um, what it is we need as humans to be our best selves and 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 who we are. Um, and, you know, we, we always feel this need to be connected to, to something and, and what is your something for me, that something is nature. And, 
and what what would it look like for you if that thing was nature as well um so I'm, I'm interested to see what you know i haven't listened to joanna macy in a long time so i'm interested to see um what she talks about in this in this recording later but um i think there's going to be a lot of a lot of nuggets of of really insightful work that people that have been doing you know this work for a long time we just i, I think a lot of it comes down to listening i guess li thinking back to that blade of grass you're listening to the blade of grass you're listening to the people that have done this work before it's it's checking your own ego at the door and thinking <coughs> what what do i need to learn to to do this better you know that reflective practice bit and i'm, I'm waffling a bit um but that's those are my nuggets my final nuggets i think well, golden nuggets they are, um, in the best in the best sense of the word. You know, not nutritionally challenged, but you know, gold, gold dust. Uh, look, what a fantastic place to leave it. Uh, I, I just think that that whole ethos of stepping outside. I was talking to another guest in the series uh, not so long ago. You know, and, and one of the her, one of her themes was look the need to expand the scope of uh, professional practice, you know, through the code of ethics and, and stuff like this. It seems to me that you're talking here about that anthropocentric, ecocentric divide getting us to step outside of our human-centered worldview i mean what much more literal way could you do it you know and literally touching a grass blade you know thinking about the grass blade as an actual being which it is you know in in a real sense an other than human being but even so still a striking image i, I can i've just got this view of a lot of practitioners you're out, out there and, and um but very very valuable to actually get us into a more ecocentric holistic relationship you know, with the natural world around us, if we are going to heal that relationship, we've got to find more expansive ways of seeing it, of dealing with it, of relating to it. So a fantastic way to uh, to end up the discussion. I'm sure you've given our audience some valuable ideas, which could help inform their own thinking, help them start further conversations and collaborations around the subject of this human nature connection within eco-social work practice that we've largely uh, focused on today. And in the future, perhaps help develop interventions aimed at achieving interlinked social, environmental and ecological justice outcomes for client groups and service users. So I hope the listeners will talk about your ideas with their friends, colleagues, within employing organisations and in their professional associations. But for now, Sandra, it just remains for me on behalf of the podcast auspice organisation Householders Options to Protect the Environment to thank you so much for your input today. Thank you very much, Andrew. It was a great chance to to talk and think about these things in a focused and also slightly different way. So thank you. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Eco Social Work in Australia, produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment. Please consult the episode text notes for possible references to topics discussed and relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.